Hi, my name is Moshe Gordon from healthhabits.com. Welcome to our free course on plant medicine. This is going to be a five-part series, completely free. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you will be able to follow along with the course without a problem just by watching the YouTube videos. But in order to fully participate, I would recommend that you sign up for our emailing list. And that way we'll be able to send you all of the course materials, PDFs, MP3 downloads, as well as all of the links that you'll need for studying in order to keep up with the course. We're going to start off with this first class. I'm just going to give you an introduction to the world of plant medicine and herbal remedies. And then afterwards, we're going to go through four of the major systems in the human body. We're going to start off with the digestive tract, and then we're going to talk about the respiratory system, the nervous system, and the circulatory system. In every class, we're going to go over the basic anatomy and physiology of each system, a list of common ailments of those systems, and then, of course, we're going to go through different herbs and plants that are used for treating those different ailments, how to use them, and how they work. So, first off, the reason that I call it plant medicine and not herbal remedies is because herb is really just short for herbaceous plants, which don't include trees and also don't include funguses and mushrooms, which are all used in phytotherapy or plant medicine. So, first off, there is Man has used plants for healing the body since time immemorial. Most probably we started as a society to use plants by trial and error. And when mankind saw that different plants caused a certain effect in the body continuously when taken, then they added them to what became the pharmacopoeia, and from that developed the entire science of phytotherapy in its very young state. Because when we came into modern terms, modern times, we were actually able to take these observations and turn them into actual facts and figures through modern chemistry and pharmacology. We've learned to actually detect which chemical elements in the plants are causing what effects in the body. Therefore, turning the entire science of phytotherapy and plant medicine into a more effective way of, of um, healing the body. Now, a lot of people don't think that plant medicine is a reliable form of therapy while treating disease in the body. And what I love to talk about are two great examples of herbs that were originally used in traditional medicine and in modern times have been the, the actual active ingredient or fetal chemical, which we're going to talk about shortly, was, was able to be synthesized in a laboratory and is now sold worldwide as non-prescription medications. The first one is the plant, the ephedra plant, which in Chinese medicine is called mawang, which is used all over the world nowadays as decongestant. The fetal chemical in the plant, which is called ephedrin, was synthesized into what is called now pseudoephedrine and could be sold in every pharmacy as a nasal decongestant and um, uh, also for congestion in the lungs. The second one, which is possibly even uh, more widely known over the counter pharmaceutical, is aspirin, which was originally taken from the white willow plant or the white willow tree. And eventually, scientists were able to find out that it was salicylic acid, and then synthesize that and create what was now known as aspirin. 
In addition to, to these two examples, these are just two examples that I like, but of course we have morphine, which is obviously a prescription medication, which was originally taken from the poppy plant. We've got quinine, which is used for treating malaria, which was originally used by the native South American Indians for treating fever and and um, pain, and then became the what we know as quinine, which is uh, also a far, uh, which is also a prescription medication used to treat malaria. And the last one that I love to bring up as an example is lovostatin, which is an actual natural fetal chemical, which can be found also in the oyster mushroom. And also, which is very interesting, is in something called red yeast rice, which is used widely as a food and also in medicine in China. In traditional Chinese medicine, it's also used to strengthen the blood. For some time, it was sold in the United States as a food supplement, but later on it was forbidden by the FDA to be sold as a food supplement because it contains a prescription medication. So those are just some examples of plants that have been turned into actual pharmaceuticals which have been clinically tested and proven to be effective. So how do, how do, they, how do these things work? Obviously, we have implants, we have also large concentrations sometimes. Not in some plants, there's large concentrations of vitamins and minerals. Therefore, we can use these plants as actual supplements for problems when nutrition might not be enough. And therefore, the person that's suffering, he could be suffering from a vitamin or mineral deficiency. Therefore, we use certain plants which are rich in the same vitamin or mineral. Therefore, we could heal him that way. But the true magic of plant medicine comes from the fetal chemicals, which are secondary metabolites, which interact with the cells in the body in different ways. And I'm just going to give you two very simple examples of how these fetal chemicals could interact with the cells in our body. They could either have an inhibiting or a stimulating effect. And I'm going to use the receptors on a cell membrane as an example. We have some molecules that are so similar to the same molecules in our body that are supposed to stimulate the receptor on the cell membrane. For example, if we wanted to stimulate a immune response, we would be looking for a plant that has molecules that would stimulate the same receptors that would increase the immune response in the body. Therefore, what happens is we're looking for a plant that would have an ability to actually stimulate the receptor, therefore increasing the immune response. Also, but and on the other hand, if we want to use a plant for inhibiting, let's say we want to use a antispasmodic, we want to stop spasms, muscle spasms, for, for example, we would want to find a plant that has a molecule which is similar enough to the same molecule which attaches to the receptor on the cell, mem cell membrane, and but it's not similar enough to actually stimulate it. Therefore, it attaches to the receptor, but does not cause the response of the spasm. Therefore, it creates sort of like a traffic jam on the on the receptor and prevents the spasm. And that would be what we call an inhibiting response. So those are two very simple examples of how, how plants are able to interact with the cells in our body. And I just want to leave off before I give you um, a short homework assignment just for so you'll be ready and be fully able to um, keep up with the next class where we're going to be discussing the digestive system and different ailments that it has and symptoms and which herbs are could be used for it. But also I wanted to just give you the idea of how is it that plant medicines, plants have these fetal chemicals which are so similar to our, the biochemistry of our bodies that they're able to affect it in so many ways. As when we go throughout the course, you'll be able to see the wide range of uses 
and ways that plants can be used to affect the body. So in my in my mind there's two different ways that you could look at it. You could come from the totally scientific perspective where you look at the evolution of life on earth and you realize that if you if you come from the idea of revolution revolution from I'm sorry if you come from the idea of evolution of life on earth then we all stemmed we the plants and the animals all of life on earth originated from the first cells which came into being on the planet and because we've evolved from basic cells to simple plants to more developed plants to animals to human beings but we all have the same root and therefore we would all have similar biochemistry and therefore plants even though they're far away from us as human beings on the evolutionary level but we are still related and still have certain fetal chemicals that are able to interact with the chemistry inside of our bodies me myself i actually believe in a more spiritual source of creation where there is a creator that created the world as one living thing which is all cre- all connected and that's why i strongly feel that the true state of health and vitality and wellness in the body comes through not using chemicals which were created in a laboratory for healing but natural substances that are brought to us from nature which have a, a close chemical a closer chemical makeup to us in ways that we might not yet fully understand than what was created in a test tube in a laboratory anyways you could come from either side and i i i truly believe that whether you look at it from an evol- evolutionary standpoint or from a more spiritual standpoint still the answer is the same thing is that using nature for healing is a more holistic and more effective way of creating true health in the human body okay so once again if you're watching this video on youtube then i strongly suggest that you sign up for our email so that we'll be able to send you all the course information for you to really participate otherwise follow continue to follow us on youtube so that you'll get uh, an update when the next class comes out and until then go through the basic anatomy and physiology of the digestive tract and that'll help you just to, to have a better understanding of what we're talking about in the next class until then I'm Moshe Gordon from healthhabits.com and we'll see you next week take care and be well